When Moses spoke to the Lord, he said, show me your ways, so that I might come to know you. Okay, we need to know how to come to God. We need to know his ways, and uh, we need to know the principles of his presence. He said, teach me your ways, your laws. Teach me, Lord, how to come before you. And um, with Israel, the children of Israel, he was kind of grieved with that generation, 40 years in the wilderness, you know. In Psalm 95.10, he said, 40 years long, I was grieved with this generation because, it said, they didn't know my ways. Now, they received of his goodness, they received of his healing, they had manna from heaven, they had water out of the rock, they had all of that, but they didn't know God. How many of you know you can be thoroughly Pentecostal and not know God? Very little response from that. Let me say it again. You can be thoroughly Pentecostal and not know God. You can prophesy until you're blue in the face. You can have hands laid on your head until you're bald. But that will not make you know God. Okay? And uh, Moses he said, God, show me your ways that I might know you. Okay? And uh, they didn't know the ways of God. They didn't enter into rest into God's presence and walking with God. And, uh, you know, we get so complicated in our approach to the things of God. But there are certain laws we need to understand and practice. And, uh, you know, we talked about last week, if you remember, such things like love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness. They are not just attitudes. They are that, but they're not just attitudes. They're much, much more than that. They are a power. They are a form of light. When you manifest these things, you release a power, light, um, from your life. And, um, you know, each of the attitudes radiates out from that person as a power. We need to understand this, a power, a vibration, a physical power. Hang on, we'll get them out. That's it, it's nearly there. <laughs> Praise God. If you're listening to this on tape, we've got a pigeon in the meeting. <laughs> we might need this. Uh, the, maybe we can leave the door on. Okay. Yes. Okay, you got them out. Praise God. So, every attitude, whether it's every negative, selfish, selfish, jealous attitude, anger, bitterness, unforgiveness, carries its own vibration, its own power, and uh, which is discernible in the spirit as a realm, as a color, as a force, as a power, as a light. And it will cl you will clothe yourself in that light and that power as you manifest these negative attitudes, and that power will draw you even further into it. And uh, you will be clothed by it. Every trait that is manifest, good or evil, is manifest this way. Okay, there's a light and a power associated with it. Every evil carries its own dismal, depressing color and a disintegrating vibration. We talked about Luke 11:35. Jesus said, Be careful that the light in you doesn't become dark light. Okay, when our, negative, when our attitudes are negative, the light becomes a different color. It is a dark light. And... Uh, we talked about this, remember putting on the garment of what? Praise for the spirit of heaviness. Putting on the garment of praise. And we looked at just what that really means. The word garment there means to wrap in a cloth or a veil. And the word praise is from a, a Hebrew root, root word, halal, which means to shine with color. Okay, the word praise there means to shine, literally means to shine with color. So you don't realize when you are praising God, you begin to emanate something, which is discernible in the spirit realm by demons, by angels, but usually not by Christians. Okay? And if it's negative, it is dark light, it draws powers of darkness into it. If it is the light of God, then it draws that realm also into it. So putting on the garment, the, the covering, the clothing of praise, you see the... the um, the garment of praise, the garment of color and, and sound and light. Okay. 
And so we need to kind of appreciate that and understand that. That power flows out. Most don't realize your attitudes clothe you in either light or darkness, which is very discernible in the realm of the spirit. Okay? We talked about, we touched on uh, three primary virtues which are important. That is faith to believe. Faith is important. There's a beautiful light and power and glory and uh, beautiful blue light, faith manifest as blue in the realm of the spirit all these colors around the throne of God praise is a glorious golden light thanksgiving the deep red light now we talked primarily about thanksgiving last week I mean I hope you've been doing it you know it's a very very powerful thing and if you don't practice this if it doesn't become a way of life with you you're not going to go, be able to go further in God and uh, so we looked at that you know in depth, if you de- develop these attitudes, this, this flow from your life, you'll begin to change dramatically, you know. And so, we looked at all of that. And uh, the law of God, you know, health, provision, understanding, love, anything is multiplied by being thankful. Okay, so we, uh, we looked at that in, in depth. And so, I want to go on today from there. Hallelujah. And uh, in Matthew 5, 17, Jesus said, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. And then in James 2, 8, it says, If you fulfill this royal law, this prime law, this royal law, according to the scriptures, which is, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as yourself, you will do well. The prime law, the royal law, if you fulfill this, you'll do well. Okay. The Old Testament mainly deals with our approach to God through the law. Sets of rules, okay? Ten Commandments, the law, and sets of rules. The New Covenant supersedes this with a higher law, which Jesus said was love. Okay, that's the only law, love. The New Covenant. The Old Testament approach to God is with offering sacrifices. You know, they had to bring a lamb, a turtle dove, or a sacrifice, and various offerings they brought to the Lord. In the New Testament, there is only one sacrifice that is acceptable, and that is of a broken heart and a contrite spirit. That's the only acceptable offering in the New Testament. And uh, this is highlighted in Luke chapter 18 and verse 11, where it says, talks about the Pharisee who stood and prayed uh, to God and said, God, I thank you, I'm not as these other men, extortioners, unjust, and even as this publican, I fast twice a week, I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would, uh, would not lift up as much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, Be merciful unto me, a sinner. Jesus said, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other, for every one that exalts himself shall be abased. He that humbles himself shall be exalted. So, you see the contrast. And, uh, okay, in 1 Peter 2.5, Scripture says that ye are also a living stones built into a spiritual house, a holy priesthood. Why? To offer up spiritual sacrifices. What are those spiritual sacrifices? To offer up spiritual sacrifices which are only acceptable to God. Okay? Psalm 51 verse 17 says, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Okay, a broken and a contrite heart. The word broken is a Hebrew word to open, to be broken asunder or to open. It also has the connotation of being honest with God, uh, a broken, being honest and open. And the word contrite there is the word for being penitent, coming to the Lord. And so Jesus picked this up in Matthew 5 when it says, He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He's talking about an attitude, you see. Blessed are the poor in spirit, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Humility and penitence. And so, now, we hear a lot about dying to self. You know, there are books written on it. There are series in it. Dying to self. You have to die to self. You have to die to the flesh, you know. But what really does that mean? 
You know what? What does it mean? You have to be very careful because, as Christians, we are orientated towards law, not grace, and so we usually interpret scriptures in the light of law, not in the light of grace. So when we're talking about you know dying to self, dying to the flesh, what does it really mean? Well, for one, it has nothing to do with works, and uh, has nothing to do with works. And uh, has nothing to do with how you dress. You know, we have funny ideas of holiness. We have this kind of idea about holiness of abstaining from things. You know, you, you, you talk to people about consecration. You talk to people about sanctification. You talk to people about holiness. And the thing that springs to people's minds is that they have to give up something. What do you have to abstain from. You see, it always works. We give up something. We give up something for God. He's going to bless us. How many of you know that's not the basis of any form of blessing whatsoever in the entire New Testament? We give up something, you know. It's uh, abstaining from. Taking a vow of poverty. There is absolutely no worth in it whatsoever. No gain. Well, there's a bit of loss to you, maybe. But that's about it. <laughs> you know, these, these are works to attain favor with God. Now, that's an Old Testament concept. It's an Old Testament setting, you know. And so, it has nothing to do with being holy, whether you wear makeup, whether you don't wear makeup. Whether you wear your skirts above the knee or below the knee. Whether you wear sleeveless dresses or non-sleeveless dresses. You know, go get rid of all this garbage. It has nothing to do... I mean, God doesn't even notice it. It has nothing to do with coming to God and knowing Him. It has nothing to do with holiness whatsoever. Now, we need to kind of understand, you know, this whole thing about dying to self. The New Testament equivalent of dying to self is simply repentance, brokenness and humility. You can put it all into that little nutshell. Dying to our will in order to embrace His will. Simple as that. Repentance, brokenness, humility. Dying to our will. In other words, in order to embrace His will. Contrite and a broken spirit. That's what we're talking about, okay? Repentance, brokenness, humility. Dying to our own will in order to embrace Him. God wants this in all of our worship and all of our prayers. You know? When we come from a, a contrite or a broken heart to God, it contains all of the outpourings of our burdens, our past mistakes, our pride, our weaknesses, our failures, our complete surrender to the will of God. That's kind of contrite spirit. Being open, an open heart or an open heart the broken or an open heart is an honest heart before God. You see, the publican said, I'm not like these men. Uh, the, the, the Pharisee said, I'm not like these other men. I am this, this, this. But the other guy said, to him, Lord, I don't even want to lift my head to you. You know, he, there was an, an, an attitude there in his heart of, of, of brokenness. You know? And so we're talking about in this brokenness, it's coming to God with honesty with all of the things that trouble us in honesty, all of the burdens, our past mistakes, our pride, our weaknesses, our failures, with a complete surrender of our will to Him. And when you learn to bring this kind of offering, this kind of sacrifice to the Lord, you will then will begin to open yourself to the grace of God to receive His love. You see? And these are the requirements to receive His light and His glory. See, we're talking about over the last few weeks about God's going to visit His people. But when He does, it's going to be deep repentance and all of those kind of things. And that is true. But you know, it is never God's highest to come with such a level that it almost kills us through repentance. God wants us to approach Him with an open and honest heart. And when that comes, that move of God comes, it will enhance far greater than what, we, what we've got from God. We need to begin to move now towards that. And today... We need to keep that, those things important in our mind. What is holiness? What is it? It's not things we abstain from. 
It's an attitude of heart. You see, a contrite and a broken heart, an honest heart, coming before God. And, uh, and it's, 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 you see, what, what, whenever God is breaking out around the world, He's breaking out, first of all, where ministers are being honest with God. The leaders are being honest and saying, Lord, what we've got is really we don't have anything. We've missed it by miles. We don't have anything to offer the world. We don't have enough of God to even interest the world. That's an open and a contrite, broken heart. Wherever leaders around the world are beginning to pray like that, God is beginning to move. Yes, that's the sacrifice, the kind of sacrifice that God wants. Now, today, I want to talk to you about the river of life as it relates to all of this, the river of life. And um, I need, you, you need to have an open mind because I want to talk to you about some things which you're going to need an open mind for, okay? So, um, in Revelation chapter 22, verse 1, it said, God, you know, he, and he showed me a pure river of water of life, okay? A river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. And in the midst of the street it went. And on either side of the river there was the tree of life, which bore twelve manner of fruit, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Okay. Afterwards he brought me again, this is Ezekiel 7, 47 now in verse 1. I just read in Revelation 22, now I'm reading from Ezekiel 47, 1. Afterwards he brought me again unto the door of the house, and behold, waters, a river issued out from under the threshold of the house eastward. For the forefront of the house stood towards the east, and the waters came down from under the right side of the house, of the south side of the altar. So this is a temple. And he said unto me, These waters issue out towards the east country, and go down to the desert, and go into the sea, which when they come into the sea, the waters of the sea shall be healed. And it shall come to pass that everything that liveth and moves, whithersoever that river shall come, it shall live. And there shall be a very great multitude of fish, because these waters shall come hither. For they shall be healed. And everything liveth where the river came, where the river touched. Now we're familiar with that passage of scripture. Now, when we're talking about the river of life here, we're talking about there's a river pure crystal, talked about in Revelation 22, we're not talking, you know, this river is real. We're not talk, talking metaphorically. Um, it's, you know, we're not, the writer wasn't u- using poetic language here. This is a real river. Okay, I've seen this river in heaven, but from quite a distance, but I've seen this river. It is a real river. And... Uh, it is spiritual in substance, but it looks like water, but it's spiritual in substance. It is very, very real. And, uh, you know, we often think of this river that you have to cross the river, you know, when you die. Um, when we die, we, 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 before we enter fully into heaven, we have to go through the river, you know, and the river washes away all the filth and the effects and the results of sin in our lives, the bad memories, the mistakes, and all are washed away and forgotten. And, uh, you know, we sing hymns about crossing the river. Shall we gather at the river? You know, row, row, row the boat. <laughs> True. They, we, we, it's a little lot of our hymns in our songs about shall we gather at the river? Crossing the river, you know? And uh, it's, you know, it's very real. There is a river when people die, and particularly when they die, and, and you know, that they, they, they come to the outer gates, they come to just the brink of paradise, and they have to go through this river. Because it washes away the memories. It is a river of life. It is powerful. It is healing. It is very, the very life of God flows in this river. The very love and the life of God flows in it. And uh, it fits them to be able to kind of handle heaven, where there's no impurities. And so, this is part of that. But, you know, and I want to read something about that. How many of you read the book Intramuros? 
Intramurals, you saw. Nobody's read that book? Intramurals? <laughs> Intramurals is Latin. It is Latin. <laughs> the book's not in Latin, though. <laughs> It's Latin for my within the gates. It means within the gates, okay? Oh, it was written about a century ago, okay? It's gone under a number of different names, but you should get a hold of it and you should read it by uh, Rebecca Springer. And uh, this lady who died and was in heaven, well, in heaven for, I think, three years, according to their time. You know, there's a difference between earth and heaven, uh, time-wise. Uh, but I want to just read a, a little bit from that because... Um, she dies, and, and, uh, and uh, her brother meets her, and she's, she is so weak because she's been incredibly sick while on earth, and he picks her up and, and carries her across after she's dead. Now, he carries her, and um, he said, lifting, he lifted me gently to my feet. He said, come, I want to show you the river. When we reached the brink of the river, um, which were just a few steps further on, I found that uh, I was right at the water's edge of this river. I saw flowers blooming all the way down to the river's edge and many colored pebbles which, were, which the entire bed of the river was lined. Uh, I want you to see these beautiful stones, he said, said my brother, stepping into the water and urging me to do the same. I drew back timidly saying, I, might, I fear it is cold. And you got to remember, she, when she died she was very sick. Not at least, he said, with a reassuring smile. Reassuring smile. Uh, he said, just come in as you are. She said, I glanced down at my lovely robe, and which to my great joy I found was similar to the rest of those people around here in this place. And just as you are, with another reassuring assuming smile, he said, come. Um, thus encouraged, I stepped into the gently flowing river, and to my great su surprise found the water in both temperature and density, almost identical with the air. Deeper and deeper uh, grew the stream as we waded into it until I felt the soft uh, water playing about my throat. As I stopped, my brother said, just a little further. And I said, it will go over my head. And uh, then, he, the, the brother said, so what? She said, I cannot breathe under water, I will suffocate. An amused twinkle came into his eyes and said soberly, we don't do those things here. <laughs> Which is true. You don't suffocate in heaven. I realized the absurdity of my position and uh, with a happy s smile said, all right, I'll come in and plunge headlong into the water which soon bubbled and rippled several feet above my head. To my surprise and delight, I find I could not only breathe but laugh and talk and see and hear as natural underwater as above it. I sat down in the midst of these many colored pebbles and filled my hands with them. My brother lay down upon them as he would have done on a, on a lawn and laughed and talked joyously with me. Then, you know, she goes through a whole kind of thing of this whole thing. She said, um, uh, I'll have to skip a bit. Behold, as we neared the shore, my head once more emerged from the water. Uh, the moment the air struck my face and hair, I realized that I would need, need no towel or hairbrush. My flesh and hair and even my garments were soft and dry as before as the water touched them. The material out of which my robe was fashioned was unlike anything I'd ever seen on earth. It was soft and emitted light, uh, reminding me of silk crepe. crepe than anything I could recall, only much, much more beautiful. Um, I fell, it fell about me in soft, graceful folds. She said, what a marvelous water, what wonderful air, I said to my brother as we again stepped out of the river. And um, uh, then she said, I felt something. She said, I walked a few steps and turned and looked back at the river and said, Frank, what has this water done to me? I feel like I could fly, like all of my the memories of my past, the earthly bad memories have been washed away. It has washed away the last of earth, the earth life and fitted me for the new life upon which, which I have just entered. And so she goes on and on. Just a little further in the book, she talks about a guy who had just murdered his mother and had repented just before he was executed. And um, it goes on to say that I had most difficulty dealing with this person. And... Uh, to enlighten and help this man who suddenly plunged from apparently honorable life into the very depths of crime. 
I have never been able to get him to come with me to the river um, where these earthly cobwebs would be swept from his brain. Uh, his excuse being always that God's mercy is so great in allowing him inside heaven's gates at all that he is content to remain on the lowest scale of enjoyment in life. No argument or teaching thus far could make him alter his decisions. He was um, led astray uh, and killed his mother uh, and uh, was executed and uh, repented um, just prior um, to him being executed. He said, uh, does his mother know he is here? Does she know is his arrival? No. He said, she is entirely unaware of his her arrival. And uh, should I go and tell her to help him get through to this place of coming to the river? Um, she said, how long was he in prison? Almost a year. Has he seen Christ yet in heaven? No. He begs not to see him. He is very repentant and grateful to be saved from the wrath he feels was his just punishment. But though he is conscious that, that his sin is forever forgiven, he does not yet feel that he can ever stand in the presence of Jesus. And, uh, and so it goes on for a while. Finally they brought his mother and his mother could um, convince him to come down to the river with her. My father had explained to the mother that the first thing to be accomplished was to get his her son to the river. So we now hear her speaking to him. Eventually they got him to the river. Thank God, my father said fervently, there will be no further trouble now because the river will wash away the memories, the past, all of the hurtful things, all of the bad things out of his life. After this divine washing in the river, he came forth a changed person. You know, there's a lot more in that book about the realm of heaven. The point here is this. See, we often think of this river as being in heaven. And that we um, die, we have to pass through the river. It does the final cleansing in our life. You know, all of the last things that have to be gone from our life. The things we've held on to, the bitterness and the memories and all of those things. But finally, when we go through that river, they'll be washed away. And that is true. However, while all that is true, it was never God's best that we wait for death to cross the river for all of this to happen. Ezekiel saw this river flowing into the earth out of the house of God. And the Lord, you see, is coming for a church without spot and without wrinkle. A church that has been through that river, lives in that river, while here on earth. There is a river in these last days that's going to flow from the house of the Lord. And it says, every person that river touched was healed. And there's a strong Hebrew word which means to be totally made whole. And it's, it says, the fish should touch the fish of the sea. That's a coming harvest. It says, every one of them were healed when that river began to flow into the earth. You can imagine this incoming harvest with all of the problems that the people have in the world today and all of the things that they, this generation has been into. They're going to need that river on the earth long before they ever get to heaven. And this is what Ezekiel, you see, was talking about. He said, wherever the river flowed, it brought life. They shall live. And there was a very great multitude of fish because these waters shall come here and they shall be healed. And everything the river touched were healed. There is a river, you see, that, that, that is available to us here and now. And, uh, you know, the Lord is coming for a church that has been through that river. Now, this river runs between the two realms, you know, almost earth and heaven. It's just in the entering stages of paradise. It's in the outer court, just where the labor was in the tabernacle, which contained the water. It just as symbolically as crossing Jordan takes us into the promised land. So, going through this river will take us into our promised land here and now in this life. And this river is a divine substance. It's incredible life and power. It's a river of life, you know. And uh, it's, a, it's an incredible river that flows from the throne of God here into the earth. And then this next move of God, this river, is going to flow with such power 
into this earth that multitudes upon multitudes will not just be swept into the kingdom of God not just millions of people swept into the kingdom of God but they'll be healed they'll be restored they'll not even have memories of the bad things they've been into that river will erase it all until he has a bride on this earth without spot and without wrinkle, without any bad memories of the past, without any bitterness, with all hurt is swept away, and they stand as a perfect bride before the Lord. And God will not be satisfied until that is achieved. And he will not come again until that is achieved. Now the, the church is way below, living way below all of that. The church is way, way below uh, all of those things. You know? We preach it, we talk about it, but we don't experience it. Right? We don't experience it, right? Okay, just good, good to get a good confession of honesty. Okay. And uh, it's, uh, you know, this river is an incredible river. It's flowing through the vast glory of God's love is this river and, and you can contact this river by contacting the love of God you say that again you can contact this river by contacting the love of God, this is the law of life you know and uh, the flowing of this, this river, this stream, this river it is a river of God's concentrated love See, God is love. It's the outflowing of God. God is love and God is light. Two things. It's the outflowing of God. It comes out of the heart of God under, from under the threshold uh, into the earth and it is concentrated love. You know? We need to think about this because it's the key to many things. And, um, you know, we are so works orientated. We, we are so, you know, what pleases God? You know, we have you know, our service, our sacrifices, they don't please God. Even our service to Him doesn't please Him. We need to serve Him, but that doesn't, that's not the thing that pleases Him. What we abstain from, what we give up for God, God is not interested in you giving up. The kid doesn't work that way. You know, how we are changed by becoming holy, by abstaining, doing something. No. We are changed by coming into contact with God who is love. And when you connect with God who is love, something in you will die. You know, something, you'll never be the same again. Your desires, your wants will never be the same again. But it's, it's a coming into a connect, connecting with God who is love. Now, we had real difficulty understanding this. This river is a river of God's concentrated love and it holds the power of restoration and cleansing. It holds the power to wash away the effects and the results of sin in a person's life. You see, the problem is we get saved and our sins are forgiven but the effects of those sins remains within our life. The memories and the effects, the damage that sin has done and that's passed on to the next generation. You see, this river of love contains the power to wash all of that out. But it's not of works, it's of love. In the Old Testament, it was always works, what we can bring and give to God. The New Testament was the other way around. It's what God could give to us. And, uh, you know, it washes away the weaknesses, the generational weaknesses, the transgressions, the sins with all the lingering hurts and all of the memories of that thing. But you see, we have to come to God with a broken and a contrite spirit. An honest heart. An honest and a contrite heart. Bringing before God our condition. Holding them out to God's love. And this river can wash it away. You see, this river is eventually going to restore the earth. It flowed into the earth and the trees that grew out of this river were for the healing of the nations. I want to talk to you sometime over the next few weeks about relating to nature because nature is not just an abstract thing. Nature is living and every form of nature has some form of memory 
And, uh, you know, and every form of nature responds to love or hate. To respond. The trees out there, you know, the animals you have in your home or whatever will respond. The tree, they have a chemical memory. And uh, it's very, very interesting. It's the trees, the trees and the, the, the whole of nature around you is affected by the light and the power that's emanating from you. And if it is dark light, they're not affected very well. If it is God's light, they respond. Nobody lives unto themselves. You have an effect wherever you go. The Bible says nobody lives unto himself or dies unto himself. You have an effect wherever you go. You leave behind you a trail. Wherever you go, you can't turn it off because you're emanating this light, this power, this glory, or this dark light. See, and we, we need to understand these things. We need to appreciate these things, you know. And, and as we come before God, you know, with this, in this way, this river, you know, it's eventually going to restore the earth. But this river is going to be flowing where from? Out of us eventually. Once that river, has you've been in that river, that river flows through you. You see? Now, the way into the river, the way into the river. We enter this river by a divine law, which is the royal law of the kingdom. Okay? It is the law of love. Now, it says, but in 1 John 2, 5, it says, Whosoever keepeth his word, that was the word of Jesus, in him verily... The love of God is perfected. Okay. If we keep his word, the person who keeps the word of Jesus says, in him, the love of God is going to be perfected. What word? What word was he talking about? What was John talking about if we keep his word? You're talking about keeping the whole Bible? No. You're taking it in the context of what he was talking about. You know? He was talking about to keep his word it says in 1 John 5, 1, 5, it goes on, Then this is the word which you have heard from him from the beginning, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Chapter 2, verse 10 says, If you love your brother, you abide in the light, and there is no occasion of stumbling. He said, John thirteen thirty four, A new commandment I give unto you, what? That you love one another as I have loved you, that you love one another. John fifteen seventeen. These things I command you, that you love one another. And so, John was talking about this. He was referring back to the words of Jesus. He said in 1 John 2, 5, But if you keep his word, the thing that the law that Jesus taught you, he said the love of God will be perfected in you. In other words, if you love, love will be perfected in you. See, we talked about last week, once you start emanating something, that light which you emanate, if you emanate love or forgiveness or thankfulness, that light, that power comes from you as a power, as a light, and it embraces you, it's wrapped in you, and it takes you further into it. As you love, you wrap yourself in a garment, just like when you praise, you wrap yourself in that garment of light and color. When you love, You have that this has an effect. You emanate something of the love of God. You begin to love. And God's love will begin to fill you. Now, it was very simple what he was trying to say. If you love, love will be perfected in you. And you'll begin to enter this river of God, which is the stream of his life. That river is the river of love. And as you become love, this river flows to you and through you and out of you. Now, we Pentecostals always want to do something. You know? God said, for goodness sake, just love. If you do this, you fulfill all of the commandments. Just love. I want to go to another convention to get something more. And you come back just the same. See, it's not in 
all in the knowledge of all of those things. It's understanding the ways of God. You know, I just want to be prophesied over and I'll change. Oh, no, you won't. The moment you get prophesied over, things are going to get worse for you. Right? We talked about that. We spent one whole sermon on that. Okay? It'll get worse. If it's from God, things will get worse for you. So, it's not in that. Right? And if you not, don't believe on me, get, get the tape that, on, on that prophetic. That you need to understand that, that, the realm of prophecy. You see, Jesus, for goodness sake, I've made it simple. That if you just love, love everything. Love nature. Love each other. Love your friends. Love your enemies. He said, if you do that, you'll begin to emanate something. And in that, what you emanate is pure love will begin to transform you, will begin to change you. You will be changed. It's as simple as that. You will be changed. Love will transform you. It gives you access to the river. You know? It, it's, it, it will purify. It will sanctify you. It will make you whole and free. It will give you access into that realm of God. You see, once that river has touched your life and begins to flow through you, you can step into heaven. You can step into the promised land while still here on the earth. That was the doorway in. Everybody who dies has to pass through that river before they can really handle heaven. Has to do something in their life. While here on earth, the Bible talks about days of heaven upon earth. If we're going to live in that, we have to go through that river. And we enter into that river because it is a river of pure, concentrated love. If you start to just do this one thing and begin to perfect it in your life, you'll step into the river. And I tell you, that thing will so change you, it is power beyond our comprehension. You know? You can come with thanksgiving. We talked about last week about thanksgiving. Let me just say something. The color of love is white, but it enhances all of the other colors. If you are giving thanksgiving with pure love, the, the, the light that comes from thanksgiving will become more vivid, more powerful, more vibrant if it's connected with love. Now, it's, it's important to, to recognize, you know, not only that, you see... What we clothe ourselves in spiritually, we're talking about a light and power, a vibration, light and power, energy source. What you clothe yourself in affects your physical body and affects your soul. And if it's negative, it's going to affect your physical body. Negative, you'll get weaker. You'll begin to get older quicker. You'll begin to degenerate at a much faster rate because it is a power that works in your flesh, your physical body. However, if the reverse is true and you walk in love and light and forgiveness, that power codes you also. It is the greatest beauty treatment you can ever have. You see, there's going to be a generation on this earth will overcome the last enemy, which is death. And it's not, this is not going to be some sovereign act of God. It's going to be because the people have already been through this river and they already are being transformed. Death, you see, is the last. It was never, never, and still is never God's perfect will for us to die. Enoch proved that. And others in the Word of God. You see, but you see, we live below the conditions which allow us to live at that realm, you know? And love will transform you. It will touch every atom of your being, will be affected. Healing, restoration, purification will begin to take place. You'll be anointed with light. When you begin to love God with your mind, whole heart and your soul, you know, when we're talking about loving God, it's not just words. We need to spend time along with God doing one thing, and that's just loving Him. With your mind, and with feeling, with your emotions, and with strength. And you need to just spend time just doing that. You don't even have to necessarily speak, although it makes, sometimes makes it easier when you do speak. But you need to spend time just, just, just loving God, coming to Him. Because if you do that, you see, 
If you come to the place where your mind and your lips lose the power to hurt, you will step into this river. Let me say that again. When you come to the place where your mind and your lips lose the power to hurt, you will step into the river. I can feel the anointing on that so strongly. Let me say it again. Okay. It, it's really important. When your mind and your lips lose the power to hurt, you will step into the river. And when you step into the river, you will be totally transformed. Totally transformed. See, we're not just talking here about attitudes. Our attitudes are a power. They emanate a power. That power clothes, that power, you are clothed with it negatively or positively. And it will draw you into itself further and further and further. The more you love, the more you'll be drawn into it. And into the love of God. But you see, when your mind and your lips lose the power to hurt... You see, you can forgive someone but still think real bad about them. Your mind hasn't lost the power to not hurt anymore. And what you think, you will speak. In Romans 13, and verse 8 says, um, Owe no man anything but love one another. For he that loves one another has fulfilled the law. And it says, Went on to say in verse 10 of Romans 13. Now listen, he said, Love doesn't work any evil to his neighbor. It's got nothing to do with whether they're good to us or bad to us. It says, Love worketh no evil to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the whole law. See, these are the keys to the kingdom. And to be honestly, Pentecostals have missed it by a mile. They don't understand the ways of God. They've missed it by miles. And so we keep on down this road, you know, and we become more and more frustrated. You know, we get touches of God in a meeting. But a week later, you're just the same. If you're honest. Now, God's after permanent change in our lives. You see... It's the pathway to glory, this. You see, 1 Corinthians 2.9, Paul said this, because Paul knew this round we're talking about. He said, it's written, Paul said, I has not seen, nor has your ear ever heard, it hasn't even entered into your heart, the things that God has prepared for those who love. You've never dreamt what is ahead for those who just love. That's what he was saying. It is the way into the manifest presence of God because it opens this river to you. This river is available here in this life and it opens that river to you. And you need to learn to perfect love. It's one, it's an attitude. Secondly, it's a state of mind. Thirdly, it is a choice. You know, when someone hurts you or betrays you or whatever, it is not enough that you don't hate them. That is not enough. Okay? Or, it's not enough that you don't dislike them anymore. It's not enough that you don't retaliate. That's all passive. God says you have to love them. One, starts in the mind. That's the hard bit. The way you think about them, okay? The way you think about them. You've got to love them in your mind, first of all. Okay? Then you've got to love them with feeling. That's your emotions. But you can't love them with feeling until you first get this right, loving them with your mind, the way you think about them. Okay? So look, everybody... Everybody gets it wrong at times. Everybody makes mistakes. Everyone does the wrong thing at times, right? 
you're going to be betrayed by someone, by quite a number of people by the time you grow old. That's life. Okay, it's just life. <laughs> okay, and, but let's, and everybody is not going to like you. Self betray you. Everybody's not going to like you. Why should they? <laughs> Everybody's not going to like you. <laughs> you, know? Um, you know, you're going to face rejection. That's life. Did you see? Those things can hurt you, they can destroy you. They can make you bitter. They can leave scars on your life which really never get healed. And the only, the bottom line is two things. Forgiveness, but that's not enough. That's part of it. Forgive them and to love them. And that means to love them, not just to a choice from your mind, but also with feeling from the heart. To love that person. You've got to think, the way you to sit down and think love towards them. You must send out love with power and strength of mind, emotion and will. Love them in your mind. Develop it. If you begin to develop love in every situation, wherever you meet, everywhere, under all circumstances, not just people, but nature and life and things and all of the good things around us, the stars, the moon, everything. Look at all of the good things in this world. I'm even talking about the, the things that even man has created. Man's created some wonderful things. You can, uh, you can love architecture. You can love all kinds of things. You need to become love. You see? We Christians are so narrow-minded. God says, love everything. Everything. Francis of Assisi had such a relationship with the animal kingdom because of love that they became his, totally his friends. The animals were just, just became his friends. And he could relate to them. You know? And if you don't fear an animal, it will never hurt you. Because perfect love casts out fear. The strongest vibration that animals feel is fear. And the negative, the strongest they feel on the other side is love. See, the whole of creation responds to love because God is love. The universe is powered by love which becomes light in its outflowing power. The whole of the world in which we live. See, you know, Christians, I don't know what's wrong with them. They, they don't appreciate life. They don't appreciate it. Every, the little things in life, you know. They don't see the wonder of God in things. They don't love life. And so they live a very narrow kind of walk. If you want to know God, God loves everything. You want to be compatible with Him? He said He created the world and He saw that it was good. How do you look at the world? And you walk along the beach, how do you look at it? You know? What goes out of your life towards it? You know? Love God as an act. Find emotion. Spend time doing it. Send it forth. It comes out of you as light. You know? God's love will enfold you and begin to change you. See, of all of the attitudes, love is the strongest vibration, the strongest power that goes out of your life is love. And, um, you know, if you love, you will be made whole. Okay, if you love, you perfect and develop love, you will be made whole. Not only that, you will, listen to me, you will stop aging. Because the love that flows through your life will touch every atom of your being. You see? Enoch knew this. He walked with God and never died. You see, he walked in the presence and the life and the light of God. You need to pray that Lord to help you with this and give you, give you love, help you with love. But you have to exercise love. You know? And uh, you can love or perish. Over to you. But if you love, you'll live. 
If you don't love, you will perish. Or get old. You say, well, I've already got old. Yeah, that's true, because we didn't understand these things. And very few through the years, only very few, a handful of people who knew the Lord understood these principles. And all of them walked off this planet without dying through the river into the presence of God. Now you see, I want to kind of, we've got to open our mind just a little wider to, to the greatness and what God really, you know, has intended for us and what his purposes for us is and, and how we are changed. We are not changed by law, by keeping rules, we are changed by love. That's the thing that changes you. That's all you have to do. Jesus said, if you do this, you fulfill all the law. If you fulfill all the laws of righteousness and every other law, you will just love. It is such a power. The Bible says love never fails. It has never yet failed to achieve. Love never fails. It's impossible for love to fail. You see, and you put on that clothing of love and light... And it flows from you and it flows through you and it begins to change you. You see, when Paul was dealing with the gifts of the Spirit in 1 Corinthians 12 and he went through the gifts of the Spirit, which Pentecostals are very familiar with. Look, he went through in, in, in gifts of the Spirit and, uh, you know, 1 Corinthians 12 talks about the whole chapters on spiritual gifts. Okay? And, uh, he gets to the end of that chapter, the last verse, and he says, and he said, but listen to me, after all of this, he said, I will show you now a more excellent way. After talking about all the gifts of the Spirit, he said, I'll show you something better. I'll show you a better way. He said, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and don't have love, I'm just a sign in brass and a tinkling cymbal. And he said, even though I have the gift of prophecy, and understand mysteries, knowledge, and have not love. He said, I am nothing. Okay? A lot of people are going to eventually stand before God and say, Lord, we did this in your name, we did that in your name, we prophesied over hundreds of people, we healed the sick. And he'll look at you, and the gifts are not there anymore, they're just gifts. You didn't earn them, you didn't deserve them, and he look at you, and look at the light around you. And the light around you will betray you. Because the kind of light that is coming out of you is really the kind of person who you are on the inside. It doesn't take much discernment if you can see the colors around a person. What kind of person they are. And we'll stand before God one day, not be judged on our gifts or any of that. We, we didn't earn them, didn't merit them. They don't gain us any brownie points at all. They look at you and say, what's coming out of your life? What kind of light? And that light is generated by our attitudes. And he'll look at that and we'll be judged on that. It'll be very clear, it'll be very apparent to everybody in heaven when we step through those doors. What kind of light we are emitting? You know... The light you emit is an accurate picture of who you are. If it's dark light, demons flow into it. If it's God's light, glory light, God flows into it and surrounds you. It becomes a way of life. He said, while you have the light, believe in the light. And become children of light. And begin to walk in it. Okay? Now, you can hear all this and not do it. Okay? You can hear all this and say, well, that was interesting. Well, I think it's interesting too, but... Yeah. This thinking, that's interesting, won't change you. Okay? You have to become it by choice, by deliberately doing it. Start by Spending just some time quietly with God, just loving Him. Come with a penitent and broken heart, with all your failures, all of that, but just, and then say, God, only you can change me. I can't change myself, the church can't change me. 
and just come before God and say, God, the only thing can change me is your love. That's the river, the flow of God's love. And just begin to love Him. With first with your mind, then with some strength from your heart, your emotions. Begin to love Him. Begin to strengthen it. Begin to perfect it. Begin to let your love go towards God. You need to, in fact, you need to do that more than praying at the present time. Because eventually, if you do that, you'll be clothed in the armor of light and you will be protected. But you need to pray, of course. Don't go out of here and say, Neville Johnson says we don't have to pray. Okay, you need to pray. But this is a priority right now. If we don't get this right, we're not going to be ready for that wave that's coming in. Okay? And so it's not difficult. You've got to love life. Love life. Love everything. Love people. Love your garden. Love the trees. Love the animals. Love God's kingdom. Love the universe. Love life. You see something which is really a nice design, nicely designed and so on. Love it. How many of you know God's a great designer? And those designs come out of his nature of who he is. Just love life. Okay? Don't live in the past. Live in the present. Live in the now. Come before God. Perfect these attitudes. Continue with thanksgiving. You must keep that one up. We talked about it last week. It's really, really important. But the thing that enhances all of these other things is this one central flow of love. Just begin to love. Now, some of you have been really hurt by people and you still can't, you're still not over it, you still have attitudes. You know, you've got to get past just forgiving the person. Because that won't take you where God intends you to take it to the first stage. You've got to love that person. You know? God views things very differently than we do. He looks at circumstances behind people and why they do things and how these things come about. We only see our side of it, you know. And God sees a much overall picture, a better picture than we do. We're not, you know, we're not clever enough to judge anyone. We're just not with it enough. We're not clever enough. We don't know the reasons, the background, the circumstances, the upbringing, the hereditary problems. We don't know all of those things. We don't know those things. We're not clever enough to judge a person. But we should be smart enough to love them. Because if you don't, it's to your detriment. Okay? So how do you do it? You do it by choice. You forgive. You do it by choice. You love. One, by choice. And then you get your mind in harmony with your choice and you begin to think loving thoughts about that person so that it's not just as a choice you're loving them with your mind and then you begin to love them with your heart and there's an outflow of love you want the very best for that person you pray for the very best for that person you're happy when good things happen to them because you love them when you do that, the hurt that was caused by that circumstances, whether it was their fault, your fault, or a bit of both, will be healed. And the scar that's gone into your life will be healed out of that circumstances. See, love makes you whole. It makes you whole. And when you come to that place where you've lost the ability to hurt, with your thinking and your mouth, then you're going to be clothed in light. Not hard. There's not some mystical formula here. There's not some religious thing you have to do. Just love. And get it right, perfect it. And you will be transformed. You will be transformed. How many of you know there are people out there, there are more people 
who love God outside of the church than are in the church today. And you know some of these people are walking in much higher realms than we are in church. That might shock us Pentecostals. But it's true. Because it has nothing to do with our religious formulas. It's got to do with who we are and how we love. That opens up that river. Jordan, or that river of life, was the gateway, stepping stone to the promised land. And you only, because it is a river of love, you can only get it into it by loving. God, with all your heart, and your neighbor as yourself. You'll get into the river, and you'll be transformed. Now our mind will try and tell us it's not that easy, it's we've got to do something. The religious thing again, you've got to resist that with all of your heart. This is grace. We have the capacity to love, God made us that way, just do it. Not the religious thing. Stop praying three times a day. And though that would do you good, but that won't transform you. It's the attitudes, it's what you are clothed in. That transforms your soul into his likeness. Let's pray. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I just pray today that you'll taste, take these words, Lord, take truth. Take, take, Lord, the truth that sets us free and just fasten it within the hearts of your people. Just fasten it in their hearts and in their minds. Lord, most people are saying there's got to be a better way than this. And it's because we've missed the way. We've gone onto other paths which are not the way. Oh, there might be good paths and even religious paths, but they're not the way to transformation. I just pray, Lord, that you will cause it to be fixed in our heart and in our minds and that it develop a hunger. And out of the simplicity, Lord, of these, the, the laws of your kingdom, keys to your kingdom, the keys... These, Lord, like Moses said, show me your ways, Lord, so that we can really know you. And it's like God said, Moses, I am love. I show you my glory. My glory is love. That's the way in. That's the way to know me. Just love and you will know me. Jesus said, if you will do my words, do what I say, you become children of light. Father, I just pray today in Jesus' name that you'll take of these words and affect change within us, within our hearts, within our direction of life, in the way we approach things. Lord, cause us to change. Lord, it's not hard. But it does require some discipline of breaking off the old ways of approach and coming to you with simplicity broken in a contrite spirit and being changed as we dwell in you and your love we give love and your love enfolds us and the power of that love the power of that light which covers us begins to transform us changes into your likeness touching every cell of our body making us whole free Lord we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus.